and uh, welcome everyone. I was hoping, I think Lisa was too, you might all bugger off next door and we'll have another cup of coffee. But, uh, <coughs> but anyway, um, it says it in the blurb, but anyway, Bob Roy's uh, situated on the shores of the Ahuri arm of Lake Benmore and uh, 2,720 hectares. We're farming about 7,000 stock units now. We're told just reached about seven and a half, really. And uh, we're 300 to 1,000 metres above sea level with a 420 mil rainfall, so we're, our bucket of water is, is reasonably small, so we had to get, uh, try and get reasonably smart in how we use it. Um, the odd time we've been asked to speak in a thing like this, it's always a wee bit humbling and you feel almost uh, a, a bit like a bit fraudulent because uh, there's a lot of good operators out in front of you and you're telling um, your story about how you operate. But what I was prepared to share once it was said uh, by another guy who got help and well, in various ways that we're more than happy to share our principles because it's the principles often that you pick up on from other people. You can't ABC from one farm to the other, but always have found that interesting. And uh, so, like I say, we're more than happy to share. So anyway, in the past, we've generally been, uh, we're a set stock property. We only had, we had about four hill blocks and they're all around 500 to 600 hectares. The largest one was actually 700 hectares. So there wasn't a lot of shifting around the sheep. We were having to work on a 100 day winter feeding. That's supplementary feeding everything in the winter. We were finishing all our lambs through to the works, which for merinos obviously means carting um, pretty much all of them through the winter. At a, at a reasonably high cost these days, we work on it, it'll cost about the fleece of the lamb to take it through the winter. Um, we were constantly going round and round chasing grass, didn't really have a system. We didn't have any uh, categoric numbers around it, but we really felt our hill country was in a steady decline. And just that it never seemed to be producing just quite what it did the season before. There was the ups and downs, but in a general sense, we felt that it was in decline and we needed to check that. Um, and really overall, our peak feed demand was totally misaligned to our, our, our peak growing period We're in October, November. So just when we were starting to offload, get these lambs that had just got heavy enough, shorn and killed and out of the way was when we just started growing all this tucker and just right when we started to stop growing all the tucker, we had the maximum mouse was when we weaned. So there was, there was a problem there. Um, and on, on top of what was essentially a dysfunctional system, um, we had other pressures. Um, we were in the tenure review process, which actually ended up taking us 12 years. We've just completed that in our freehold. Um, we're in the midst of, we took over water um, renewal consents. Uh, water consents that we were renewing, um, that we again just completed that this last year. And that took us 15 years and cost us in excess of 200K. Um, that was just to renew the consent, not a new one. Um, we're also in the midst of farm succession, um, trying to sort out paying out Gundy's family. Um, we've since fixed that one as well. And um, because of those three, we were, we were financially heaving, hemorrhaging money out the gate on things that weren't actually returning us anything. Um, and we were trying to handle the dry. Um, and in fact, um, at one stage, our accountant <coughs> said, um, he advised us to start looking down country for a couple of hundred acres. Um, because we, the, it wasn't working, um, and so we essentially gave ourselves three years to D-Day. Yeah, so basically you could say, in a nutshell, we were flogging a dead horse, <coughs> and, um, and the, uh, what is the definition of stupidity is doing the same thing over and over again, hoping for a different result, and that's exactly what we were doing. We are always hope, hoping upon hope and stressing for a better season next season, and I've found that stress and hope doesn't actually change the weather at all. Um, so I needed to give up on that particular approach. And just, we weren't in harmony with the property either, which was uh, one of the principles I got, uh, was listening to Doug Avery talk about his property and how he said he was trying to mash it to meet the market and the mother nature won every time. So he got smarter and, and regrouped and, um, and away he goes. And I'm sure a lot of you have heard of his story. And so, um, yeah, just ho hoping for the better season all the time and having it never come along, the light bulb went on and, and we needed to make some changes. So so we did, and um, I finally put my university degree to some use and um, taught Gundy what a support analysis was. So we sat down and, and went through our, our business um, and identified all the strengths and weaknesses and opportunities and threats. And then we actually sat down and looked in the mirror and asked ourselves the hard question is, one, did we want to be there and could we make it work? Um, and so 
then we looked even deeper and wanted to analyse ourselves and we'd had it put to us once um, that if our job ever got advertised, would we actually be worthy of, um, of receiving it? So, um, and would we employ ourselves? So um, we thought, yeah, okay, we're not too bad. Um, we'll, we'll stay on. But we identified that we did have some serious areas that we needed to change. One of the biggest changes I made then was get married, and uh, <laughs> from my point of view, I think that was pretty wise because I got a, bought a bit of knowledge and uh, some academia into the equation. And uh, but it has been, I'm not just saying this so I get a happy car ride on the way home, <laughs> <laughs> but I think it's really important. And as a couple, one plus one, I've found equals a whole lot more than two. And, and you see that again and again when you listen to couples that have uh, got together and they've overcome odds and, and have, have done really well in whatever their field may be. And uh, it's uh, you know, I'm just a big advocate for for that. And funnily enough, our old accountant, there was a specialist farm accountant. One of his first questions when he rang him up was, "Are you still married?" I don't think so. I'm going to be married a year, but <laughs> <laughs> um, so that was really good. But um, what we needed to do was form a plan of action. And uh, we needed to get <laughs> proactive and, uh, rather than reactive. And, and a lot of this stuff is just repeated, repeated. You hear it, um, Wayne Allen, Mark Allen, who was talked before. There, there's a lot of similarities in the shape for profit. Um, we needed to de stock by mid January, and this would, was where the lucerne came in. Um, we could bring sheep off the hill, get the growth rates up, we needed to get things growing faster. And particularly with merinos, no one wants to know them and things in, um, in February, let alone January. So a little merino land, weaned off a mum, there's really no market for it. So even if you virtually wanted to give it away, you couldn't get rid of them. So we needed to make sure they were, uh, they'd been growing well and fast, which means legumes, we've heard that common thread today, and, um, and get them ready by mid-January and we got some private buyers online so that, uh, who would take them away. So that all came together. And um, we needed to spell the hill during a, a growing season to stop that insidious bloody slide of uh, hammering it, really. And that was once again where the lucerne came in and we could, we could get some uh, relief from the hill country by growing this good lot of tucker down the bottom. And a higher weaning percentage was basically higher, as everyone will know, a higher um, land birth weights and better management, smaller mobs and um, <laughs> leads to the higher weaning percentage and also hand, right handed glove with that is the better weaning weights because better nourishment and they're growing better anyway. Um, so we caught up with Doug, um, Avery and Derek. Um, this came about um, back when I still made some money working off the farm and sitting in an office with Derek Moat having a meeting and Gundy was sitting waiting for me and on, the, on one of the desks there was um, an article on Doug Avery and he just Gundy sidled on up and, and grabbed it and then he started reading it and then he started asking questions and then you essentially just took over the meeting. Plus we did take over the meeting a wee bit. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it was a lot more important than what she was talking about off there. <laughs> so, so we introduced um, a loosened base. We identified areas on the farm. Um, to, uh, they both helped us with um, identifying better soil types, putting loosened into gullies. Um, and change, we, Don't get me wrong, we already had some loosened in place, but it was... Um, cut and carry, that was yeah, traditionally cut and carry. Um, so hence we started grazing um, at the right times and we actually started fielding phone calls from concerned neighbours and members of the public saying shit, the, the ewes are broken out, they're in your loose soon, um, you might want to go get them off, So, uh, which we still get. Um, it's still quite against the norm what happens where we live. The one nice thing with the loose soon too, we heard about grass losing its quality once it gets away, the lucerne's a bit more forgiving as everyone who grazes it knows because you've still got those beautiful little buds at the top so you might be wasting a wee bit but it's still the quality's still there which is a, um, a real <laughs> plus for it, I feel. And um, just on that, so once we had our plan we needed to implement it and I can't un uh, emphasise enough how good it felt to have a real plan in place because then you could relax and you had something to go ahead instead of just feeling it all at sixes and sevens and you'd listen to other people what they were doing and wonder if you should do that and you get all in a bit of a head spin and I read a really good book uh, around about that time about Pete Goss who was around the world sailor and he said it, life was really simple then when he was trying to launch a bid and get his own yacht and get underway because decisions became would it help my bid around the world and it became yes and no answers and it became a real black and white world to live in and that's what it felt like once we had the plan 
will it help these goals? And if it didn't, then it didn't work, didn't happen, and if it did, then you did it. Um, really, I know it's real simple basics, but it, but it just really helped clear the head and get, get our ducks in a row. So we've subdivided the hill country quite a lot more, which has meant smaller mobs, rotational <coughs> grazing as soon as we can. We aid scan as well, so we can get the, um, get the mobs together as soon as possible after lamb drop and get them going around the hill. Um, we're grazing the lucerne as a tent, which has uh, helped take the pressure off the hill country and also get them going uh, round and round and get the weaning rates up. And, um, and another, uh, another person I just need to briefly mention was the Boko Red of Alan Sabres. And um, he mentioned in, in the book of holistic management about overgrazing, being overgrazed but understocked. And that's pretty much summed this up in a nutshell. And he's done a lot of work, and um, as some of you will know who have read his stuff, in brittle environments and dry environments. And he takes a real step back. And how Mother Nature set it up with these large mobs of cloven hoofed animals, such as uh, buffalo and, and wildebeest and things, how they migrated, how they stayed together, and they, would, they need to trample. In a dry environment, it's even more important to get everything trampled onto the ground so that um, it can get uh, broken down and instead of just standing up there and shading out these all important legumes. So that was another, just a real principle that I picked, picked up from reading that. Um, we then started, um, again, some of the messages yesterday, we started monitoring and measuring, which then enabled us to start analysing. Um, we joined Stock Care, which used to be um, Chief of Profit and now is called Farm Care. Um, so a lot more analytical um, breaking down of, of the stock side of things. So what more weighing, condition scoring, identifies and causes causes death, um, analysing. We also um, now measure to cage cuts on the farm, doing that for several years now, um, representative parts of the farm. Um, and that got highlighted a few years ago when we tried to use the program Farmax and we were basically guessing and making everything up that we're putting in because we actually had no idea really how much the place grew. Um, and then we also put ourselves out there for any um, on-farm trials um, that we're getting asked, so um, just to give ourselves exposure to, to the specialists, um, but essentially we needed to get a grip on our system. One of the things I've found just on that too, that measuring and monitoring and things too, is systems. And um, there was a guy I spent time with in South Africa, luckily enough, who was pretty successful and he kept saying to me, Gundy, you need systems. And so with the, the stock care and those other things, we found really good with staff on, because then you can actually explain what you're going to do. Before that, I couldn't explain what I was going to do because I didn't know myself, because I was reacting in, instead of being proactive. But that's been a, a, a real plus. And then we've got buy-in and understanding of that system. So. Leading along um, on that, we've been pretty happy with our uh, flock performance as, as ticked along. We've had a few, um, obviously it goes up and down and had some challenging years as, as well. But um, basically the percentages come up, the wastage has gone down. Our, our wastage of lambing, I know one time we had a look at from scanning to weaning was about 35%. Which is not only not, not that good for profit, it's also not that good a, a story from an animal welfare point of view but it is a big potential. The kilos of lamb weaned has come up, but what sort of blurred the lines here, we were aiming at a 30 kilo lamb at about 100 to 110 days, um, which we, we did achieve in a year, but then now we've come to weaning early. And uh, when I say early, we'll wean about two thirds in about 80 days. And that's where the, um, the conception rate scanning has really come into play. And the main reason we did that one year is because we were blooming dry, but it worked really well and it was worth the dollars in the bank because obviously that 60 kilo ewe getting around is not going to let that little 25 kilo lamb eat the last clump of clover. So it's common sense that you need to get them get them out of there. And as one guy told me, that the only reason to use there after 70 to 80 days is for um, companionship and worms. <laughs> um, we've had a goal of weaning 50% of the... Of, um, the used body weight in lambs, which has been achieved, and the, um, to clip about 10%, and I'd never had a 10% of the body weight in wool. And uh, up until then, most of the merino guys in general, you just want to clip more wool, and you'd go down to the pub and have a pint and tell, them, tell how much bloody wool you're clipping off ewes, and it wasn't until I went to South Africa actually that they started saying, well, you don't want to push that too far, otherwise you'll suck the um, re reproductive performance out of them. And as this one guy explained to me, you've got two taps, a wall and a meat tap, you turn one, one on too far, the other one's got to turn off. You've only got so much product can come out of these ewes. So I started getting my head around that and, um, and it's worked really well and, and as much.
much as keeping that wool production, not keeping it down, but just keeping an eye on it so you're really not trying to get this great and get the skin on it. <coughs> Um, and then just, I won't go into details, but just um, with regards to our pasture cut, to, um, when we first started measuring um, what we were growing around the place, we are, uh, originally it was just to see how much we actually grew, um, but then we actually st um, stuck up comparison cages, so across fences to see whether or not the lucerne actually was a good return on investment when we were putting it in. Um, so we, uh, and we had an instance when we were hosting um, the Merino Benchmark Group, a discussion group at home, and, and our accountant was there and he goes, oh, this is all great, we're putting in this lucerne, but what's it cost you? And... Yeah, so what, what's this going to cost and how much is it going to return? I said, uh, well, I don't know on both counts, <laughs> but I'm sure it's going to work. And so well, that's possibly a bit of a shaky way of doing business, so you, you might want to get your head around uh, the costs <laughs> and, uh, and things. Um, since then we have done a bit of an analysis. We work on roughly $2,000 a hectare for a couple of crops of rye corn and getting it into lucerne. Um, Graham Ogle did some financial analysis. It was in a bit, it, it was before these previous two seasons, which have been a bit lean, but it, it came out that we were getting a 26% internal rate of return. So I said, what's happening? He said, well, that's the rate that you can borrow money at, and it'll be a break-even um, point. So in other words, it stacked up, it stacked up really well. So the gut, the gut was right, but uh, going on gut instinct and flying with the seat your pants doesn't work so well in this day and age when um, there's a reasonable amount of dollars involved. So. Um, the other bonus about doing the cages was that we didn't take into account a bit like the old crystal in the grass analogy is by every month going out cutting we're actually identifying what pasture species were in the blocks at those times, whether it was legume, what type of legumes, was it grasses, was there anything um, and also then we started correlating that with, with, with when those blocks actually were performing so um, we actually tied that in with which blocks are best for leaving on, um, which blocks are best for weaning on um, and also where to plant, where we're going to get the best growth from Lucerne. Um, and just as in on the side, the blue is this year. Um, we've missed, there's one year missed out between the blue and the green. Um, we had a bit of a disaster with our cage cuts last year, so, um, but this year on our branch has been quite dry. One of the nutshells of a message, uh, or the kernel said I've got out of it, is that the, the hill, we knew it varied a lot, but we didn't realise just how lot, as in just straight dry matter. But the difference in the amount of dry matter was largely due to how much legume we grew in the spring. And, and it's, it's not that visual, the legumes at home, some of those really little uh, small clovers, dried and cluster clovers, etc. They're, they're not that visual as a nice big long paddock of grass. So to visually just have a look at it, you say, wow, it's a wee bit better year or it's not such a good year. But in reality, sometimes we've, we've like this year, we've grown half the tonnage out there that we would expect to. So it, it's like someone coming along and taking half your soldiers put away. And, and it's really important to keep that in the front of your mind, just keep conscious. And the other take home was how reliable the lucerne was, a whole lot more stable, it didn't have the huge ups and downs. Uh, so it's interesting, I haven't got time to get into the whole story of, uh, about them behind our lucerne, but since then we've got two pivots have gone in, they cover 210 hectares between them. There's another couple of uh, smaller pivots we will look at putting in, so we'll have a total of 270 hectares of irrigation. Um, these pivots, needless to say, have been a, a, a large investment. They come out about $9,000 a hectare to get it from uh, native country into uh, all paddock and trough and growing grass. Or actually not grass, growing legumes. Because we've got the top one will largely go into red clover, where the fellow who works for us is standing there amongst it, and the bottom one's going to go into a loose with some grasses in it. Um, what, to back up the truck a little bit at one stage, when they, we, we, it took 15 years to renew this consent in $200,000, so it wasn't a cheap process. And the last actual mediation we had was right up here in this building, and we walked out of here and it secured us an extra 100 hectares of irrigation, which we're really happy with. But at that stage, our accountant said, you're not ready for this. You've got to get your dryland system sorted, and you've got to get it stable, otherwise you're just going to spread what's already a bit of a shaky ground. You're going to spread it thinner, and it, and it could look at toppling you. So. That was a really good take home message and the positive we got out of being held up so long renewing our water consent was that it gave us time to get our dryland house in order and to get it robust and to know what's actually going on with that dryland and so out of that we've, we're going to adopt the same principles into our irrigation and uh, Matt asked in the break what are you going to put under it we're going to finish our merino lambs because we did start um, part of the story was we started selling that, those lambs stored now we're going to retain them at home and secure some of that uh, value ourselves 
we'll be really pleased we hit um, at some of the growth rates we've got. I can't give you a seasonal growth rate, but we had some of the bigger weather hoggets over a month at 400 grams a day, which was um, really pleasing to get up to. And um, we will use it to benefit the whole property, that's the aim. And um, if we can really look after the hill a lot better through this irrigation and have these lambs finishing faster, get things going off the place quicker and look after that hill, I'd like to think we could lift our hill stocking rate by a stock unit a hectare. It'll be over a little bit of time, but I think we should be able to do that. And so instead of just looking at what this irrigation system's cost and what it returns in isolation, we'll be looking at over the whole property and how the whole property can um, can pick up and keep the whole, whole uh, area very robust. Um, and finally, um, going forward, um, the rural Tasmania Scheme, we've actually got um, aware, and yes, we are Canterbury. Uh, we're on the ECAN, our, our regional authority, so we've now been red zoned, which came at us um, like a bolt out of blue, mm -hmm. thanks to a man made lake on our shore that um, has a big um, plug in it. So, um, Lake Benmore. So, we're all now red zoned and capped at what we're currently farming at, which on average <coughs> most of us are, are capped at five kilos of N per hectare. Um, so now trying to justify uh, investment in these centre pivots um, in our new irrigation system um, is, is um, an interesting process. Um, we're lucky enough that we've just recently um, been accepted by Beacon Land to be a new demo farm where we will be monitoring how to increase um, profitability and production while decreasing our environmental footprint. Um, and um, yeah, we've got a very interesting journey going ahead, especially for Lucian. We're also going to be a trial property for precision aerial application, which is pretty exciting um, to see how that goes. It was an interesting listing next door. We um, went through there. I'm, I'm just not too sure how we stack up. They were talking about 20,000 uh, kilograms per hectare <coughs> and things like that. I don't think we're quite up to the end yet on that drawing. But um, one of the biggest take-home messages over the last few years I've got, and the people that have helped us out, is really sorting an egg. Farming, to me, what makes it really interesting is there's so much to it and so much going on. We've got finances and grasses and stock and what sort of stock and what sort of grass, all those sorts of things. There's market and marketing schemes and there's a whole lot in it. But it's to really try and stop the white noise a wee bit and shuffle things down and get the three, I just drew myself a little stool here to get the three legs of the stool in line and I think they're feed and animals and finance. I think we're, we're, we're getting to grips with our feed and we're getting to grips with our animals and getting them to produce. One of the areas of weakness, at least from a sale pad, which we don't mind admitting, is finance. And we're going to get, we're really starting to work on that now and get to grips with that. And the cap on top of all this is the people that you're surrounded with. One is ourselves. We did ask whether we would employ ourselves. And without being arrogant about it, I think we would. Um, but we need to get our ass in the gear and not rest on our laurels and really do the best job that we possibly can and then have really good people around us and that's what we've gathered up. It's a bit like you get this little positive magnet going and these other good critters start sticking to it and, um, and they take them with you and don't let you fall over. And just lastly, thanks for the opportunity and um, I realise it's been a pretty tough time going on around uh, a large area of the country through the dry and uh, I just really wish all, all of you the very best going forward in this season and hope the big guy um, gives us a wee bit of a break and uh, we'll, we'll actually get a wee bit of grass to farm with. that if he used up all his time he wouldn't have to answer any questions. Um, but we probably have got time for one or two very, very quick questions. Yeah, could you just um, go back to that correlation between um, the two cats with the wool and the, the wool and the meat? You were, you were talking about uh, a certain percentage. Yeah, it's, it's a it's a wee bit of a case, a little bit of knowledge is a dangerous thing, but when I went over, I was lucky enough to get an exchange, so I was tangled with technology, um, went on an exchange to South Africa, and that was the first time the guy asked me, what percentage of, of wool do you clip for body weight? I said, well, I don't know, we do about five and a half, six kilos. He goes, oh, how heavy are you? And I said, well, that's 55 to 60 kilos. He goes, yeah, right. right. <laughs> well, he didn't say you're dumbass, but he said, right, well, that's 10%. And he said, that's not too bad. What they'd found, they would actually, when we, we drove through a large variety of country in the, from the high belt, which is very dry and pretty sparse, down into the Western Cape, which was largely uh, loosened based pastures, and they uh, had really high production and lambing three times in two years and things like that. They they talked in percentages, and in the high belt, they'd say, whoa, you probably, probably 8%, 8% would be enough up here, and I'd never heard it 
like that. I don't know the actual figures of it myself, but the when I have come home and I've typed up the use, we took out the better what we feel are the better type of more reproductive type and the the lady I went over there with was has been in the stud industry in Australia and now is uh, runs nine mile stud down here. She said, Give me a chance let me let me out your areas basically and I'll show you how what you've got in your flock. And we passed them out and those ewes were the first mile with mixed stage ewes that did 130% and the others, uh, I think from memory, were about 118. So I was like, wow, that, the figures talk. We had this huge potential in there. And it was another thing I was thinking of today. Sorry, it's a wee bit off track for you. But it, but it led me to believe, one, that this type of sheep, I learned to like that type. Not, and it was for solid reasons because these ewes will wean me more lambs but will still cut the wool and when you get into the mechanics of it, they're a wee bit bearer, but they, they lose the eye clip, and they lose a lot of wrinkle here, and they lose the socks. Well, when we were going to Melbourne and talking to buyers, one thing, they hated socks in amongst your fleece wool. They didn't, you got, didn't get paid for blooming eye clips, and the shearers found it really hard to, to shear properly up the nets and over here, especially with the other wrinkle, and one of the, the buyer's biggest hates was variable length. So I thought, yeah, add it all up. And I said, play your bloody sheep up and get a bit of depth in them. And you've got these beautiful big uh, sheep that you can share. The shearers can share nicely. There's more usable fleece wool. And they produce you more lambs. So, so it's kind of like, uh, there's, it's all like roads lead to Rome in a way. It's, yeah. that, it's that old fashioned dual purpose. I think yeah. that's, that's where Marinos are going. It's more, it's more of your dual purpose and, and being able to have two components and that's that's what these guys would do. Yeah, and as a vet will tell you that that's big skin is like a parasite and it takes a lot of energy to keep that skin nourished. So the, yeah. a lot of wrinkly skin just takes a lot of energy. Have we got time for one more or are we done? Yeah, you have, it's me. I just, it's you! Yeah, um, it's probably, for, what's for both of them, it's probably for Lisa if, if you've got Ian Brown or Ian Trots in here too. Um, overseer numbers for Lucerne aren't great if you get what you're doing now. But the only real numbers I've heard from my similar that north are very low, Leachin, under Lucy. So hopefully that'll catch up eventually. Is there anything from you guys? Derek, to told, us, Derek um, told us a couple of years ago when we were going through the consenting process to not let them yes. press the Lucerne button, so we wouldn't let them press the Lucerne button. <laughs> um, so we got through okay. Um, but yeah, we were up seeing Mike um, a couple of weeks ago on Taupo and um, we had a look at what he's doing and we're hoping to join a bit of a licensure project down here as well to start monitoring it because yeah. yep. and that's a really exciting thing and that's one thing Mike Barton said I'm the luckiest farmer in New Zealand because I know what I'm leaching and and his figures modelled were 19 kilos and it's 5 kilos now but the fact is it's 5 kilos on cut and carry though yeah so just Yeah. So once again, there's a lot of, through that whole consent, water consenting process and things, and now Les is involved in the zone committee reported ECAN and things, that this nutrient, and we've been, the nutrient issue is going to get bigger and bigger, and with beef and lamb, we've been lucky enough to go to the Wellington workshops, a couple of them, and it's like this big wall that's coming, and it, and it, and it will come, so we need to be ready, and that's why we're really pleased that our project got approval. And that we're able to get some real figures, so we can we can actually put real figures in front of people and not models. I think I hear, I hear them clapping, so I suppose they're supposed to be clapping. Yeah, clap your bastards. <laughs> <laughs>